What's up guys? I hope all of you had a Merry Christmas and you're having a great year so far. I know it's been a while since our last podcast and our YouTube video, and I want to apologize for that. I just recently lost my father, and my world got turned upside down. Looking back on 2017, though, I still have a lot of things to be thankful for. I'm so thankful for my family and my friends, and I'm thankful that I get to be a part of PA Boards. Going into 2018, you can expect weekly YouTube videos and podcasts once again. We're working on a lot of new material behind the scenes, and I cannot wait for what 2018 is going to bring. With that said, today's topic is going to be about the flu. We're going to talk about how these patients will present, what imaging studies and lab tests to consider ordering, and finally, how do we treat these patients. The flu is an acute respiratory illness caused by influenza A and B viruses and mainly occurs in the winter months. Flu season begins in October and lasts until March, with the majority of cases occurring in December, January, and February. Now, this virus is largely going to be transmitted from person to person via respiratory secretions. For example, let's say I'm sick with the flu and I'm coughing and sneezing up large particles of the flu virus into the air. Well, since these large particles typically do not remain suspended in the air floating around and they can only travel approximately six feet, you're most likely not going to get the flu if I'm coughing in your direction and you're 10 feet away. So, transmission of the flu from one individual to the next generally requires close contact with the infected individual, such as family members living close together, clinicians examining these patients, or the child that just coughs in your face. Because let's face it, we've all had that child just cough in your face when you're examining them for no apparent reason. However, there is limited data that suggests that small particle respiratory droplets can stay suspended in the air for long periods of time from coughing and sneezing. Other modes of transmission can occur from contact with surfaces that have been contaminated with respiratory droplets. So for example, let's say I have the flu once again and I'm coughing in my hands all day and writing with my pen. Well, those respiratory secretions are now all over my pen. And let's say you are that guy or girl that never has their own pen at work and you ask to borrow mine. Well, you write a couple of prescriptions with it, and then you get a complicated patient, and you place the pen in your mouth to think. Well, before you know it, you're going to be coughing and feeling just as terrible as I am because those secretions that were on my pen are now in your mouth. In addition, although inhaling secretions into your respiratory tract from others coughing or sneezing is the primary source, one other study has suggested that transocular entry of the influenza virus can occur. So, as with all patients, whether you're in the emergency room or an outpatient setting, take a look at the triage note or the patient's initial complaint and review their vital signs before you enter the room. Does the patient have an elevated temperature? Look at the blood pressure. Are they normal tensive, hypotensive, or hypertensive? Look at the respiratory rate. Is it elevated? Look at the heart rate. Are they tachycardic? Maybe it's from the fever. And finally, look at the oxygen saturation to see if they're hypoxic on room air. Once you enter the room, as with all stable patients, start off by taking a good history and note their overall general appearance. Classically, influenza typically begins with abrupt onset of fever, headache, myalgias, and malaise. Fever, headache, myalgias, and malaise. And since the incubation period is generally one to four days, with an average of two days, the patient might tell you that they were around a family member who was sick about two days ago and have been feeling fine, but just started feeling bad today with an abrupt onset of fever, headache, myalgias, and malaise today. These symptoms are typically going to be accompanied by signs of respiratory tract illness as well, such as a non-productive cough, a sore throat, and nasal drainage. However, as with all illnesses, there's always going to be variable presentations. Your patient may present with signs and symptoms similar to the common cold, and they might not even have a fever. Other adult patients are particularly likely to have subtle signs and symptoms and may only have the dreaded complaint of generalized weakness, malaise, anorexia, or even dizziness. In addition, gastrointestinal illness such as vomiting and diarrhea is usually not a part of influenza infections in adult, but they can occur. However, they more commonly occur 10 to 20% of the time in children. Next, after you finish taking a good history of their present illness and complete a thorough review of systems, you need to focus on their past medical history. Here, we really need to focus on identifying those patients with underlying medical conditions that place them at a higher risk for complications of influenza. You can remember what adults are considered to be at high risk for complications of influenza by the demonic season of influenza. The S stands for simply being pregnant, and the risk of complications has been shown to increase during each trimester and even up to two weeks after childbirth. E stands for endocrine, such as the poorly controlled diabetic. A stands for adults greater than or equal to 65 years of age. S stands for sickle cell. O stands for obesity with a BMI greater than 40. N stands for nursing home residents, and the of in this mnemonic stands for nothing Season of influenza, the of stands for nothing. The I stands for immunosuppression, such as HIV patients, especially those with CD4 counts less than 200s. 
organ transplant patients because they're probably on some type of medicine that suppresses their immune system so they don't reject their organ transplanted, right? N stands for Native Americans and Alaskan Natives. F stands for filthy old cardiovascular disease, like the patient with congestive heart failure who already has three to four pillow or thopnea at night and shortness of breath at baseline. L stands for lung disease, such as COPD or cystic fibrosis. U stands for underlying chronic kidney disease or chronic liver disease. E stands for exposed active cancer. N stands for neurological condition that can compromise the patient's ability of handling their own respiratory secretions, such as mental retardation, Alzheimer's, or in the uncontrolled epileptic seizure patient. Z stands for zona fasciculata, because I'm sure we all still remember back to pathophysiology that the zona fasciculata makes up the middle layer in the adrenal cortex and is stimulated by the adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is released from the anterior portion of the pituitary to produce glucocorticoids. So in knowing this, we need to ask our patients if they're taking exogenous glucocorticosteroids, such as pregnizone, that could suppress the patient's immune system. And A stands for asthma, particularly if systemic glucocorticosteroids were prescribed to the patient in the past year, then we know that they're probably not well controlled with their asthma and they might have underlying severe asthma. To be complete, ask them about their surgical history, tobacco abuse, alcohol abuse, illicit drug use, and their living situation. Next, go ahead and complete a good physical exam. However, there will generally be few physical findings on exam in cases of uncomplicated influenza. Starting off with the general appearance of the patient, they might appear hot or even flushed. In the ears, you might notice slightly erythematous tympanic membranes bilaterally. Within the nose, you might notice some congested nasal mucosa with erythematous and enlarged nasal turbinates. And clinically, I tend to see a lot of noses very red and raw. Maybe that's just from blowing their nose so much, but I don't know. Within the posterior oropharynx, you might see some hyperemia and postnasal drip. Also make sure to take a look at those tonsils because it's not uncommon in the younger patient to have a concomitant strep pharyngitis with exudative tonsils as well. Listen to the heart for any abnormalities which would complicate their illness. For example, I once had a patient who presented to the ER with a high fever, coughing, shortness of breath, who clinically just looked terrible. I was working him up for the flu, pneumonia, COPD exacerbation. However, when I went to listen to his heart, it appeared irregularly irregular and he was found to be in atrial fibrillation. So just don't assume that the patient's fever is driving a sinus tachycardia and really listen to the heart. I later confirmed that this patient did in fact have the flu, but he also had new onset atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response complicating things. Of importance to note, a nationwide case control study in Taiwan looked at 11,374 patients from 2000 to 2010 with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation and its association between influenza infection and the influenza vaccination. It found that the influenza infection was significantly associated with the development of atrial fibrillation with an 18% increase in the risk, which this risk could be reduced with the influenza vaccination. Now, there were many limitations to the study that we're not going to get caught up talking about to today, but we do know that inflammatory and infectious processes can play a role in the formation of atrial fibrillation. So I think it is reasonable to consider that the increased sympathetic activity created during the infection and the pro-inflammatory cytokines might increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. After you listen to the heart, take a listen to the lungs for any abnormal sounds. Listen for crackles, which could indicate a secondary bacterial pneumonia, or it could even indicate a primary viral influenza pneumonia. Also, do you hear any wheezing, which could be an indication of a COPD exacerbation secondary to a viral upper respiratory tract infection, such as influenza? Listen to the abdomen and palpate for tenderness, making sure there's no other concomitant pathology going on. And look at the extremities, checking their capillary refill, ensuring good perfusion. Skin turgor, and do they have any pitting edema in the setting of JVD, hepatomegaly, shortness of breath, with some bilateral lower lobe crackles that could indicate congestive heart failure exacerbation as well, complicating things? So based off the history, the physical exam, and the patient presentation, it's really going to determine what laboratory studies, if any, and what imaging and therapies are needed. For example, let's say we have a patient who's 27 years old, he has no significant past medical history, who presents normotensive, non-hypoxic, non-tachycardic, with a low-grade fever of 100.7 degrees Fahrenheit. He emits a non-productive cough, which started yesterday, accompanied by an acute onset fever today, and myalgias. On physical exam, his tympanic membranes are slightly erythematous, with a hyperemic posterior pharynx, yet all other components of the physical exam are normal. In this individual, I would simply do a rapid flu test to confirm the diagnosis of influenza and treat him with Tamiflu, also known as ulcitamivir, 75 milligrams, PO, twice a day for five days. However, just the other day, I had a 76-year-old female who was a nursing home resident 
who was sent to the ER for evaluation of fever, nausea, and vomiting. She presented hypoxic on room air with an oxygen saturation of 92%, tachycardic with a heart rate of 111 beats per minute, febrile with a temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, despite a normal respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute and a blood pressure of 100 over 60. Her general appearance showed no acute respiratory distress, and she was only alert and orientated times two, with no reports of dementia to me by the nurse or the patient. However, let's be honest, guys. Demented patients are not going to reliably tell you if they have dementia or not. She did tell me she has been coughing over the past couple days and vomited once today and just feels weak and nauseous. So, if we remember our Q-SOFA criteria to help us easily identify septic patients at the bedline, and we can remember the Q-SOFA criteria by the mnemonic BAT. B stands for a systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100, A stands for altered mental status, and T stands for tachypnea with a respiratory rate greater than or equal to 22 breaths per minute. So based on the new definitions of sepsis, which is now defined as an individual with a known or suspected source of infection, and at least two out of three of the Q-SOFA criteria in my head, and only about 10 seconds into the exam, while she has a normal respiratory rate, questionable altered mentation, or underlying dementia, and a borderline hypotensive patient with a blood pressure of 100 systolic, I'm highly considering her to be septic. She cannot tell me any of the medications she's on or any underlying past medical problems, and is generally just an overall poor historian. On physical exam, her HEMT exam was normal other than dry oral mucous membranes. No cervical lymphadenopathy with a regular rhythm, but she was tachycardic to auscultation. Her lungs showed decreased air movement throughout with some crackles to her left lower lobe. She had a benign abdominal exam and normal extremities with no evidence of cellulitis or focal source of infection anywhere else. No CVA tenderness, but she did have very poor skin turgor and cyanotic fingers with a five second capillary refill. Now, in this patient, while her presentation might be secondary to the flu, you're going to want to order some more studies other than just a rapid flu test. For her, I got a CBC with differential, CMP, lactic acid, blood cultures times two, coagulation studies to include a PT, a PTT, an arterial blood gas because she was hypoxic at 92% on room air, sputum cultures, and a chest x-ray because I was thinking pneumonia with that left lower lobe crackles. I also got a rapid flu test and a urine analysis with culture. The CBC, the CMP, the chest x-ray, the PT, and the PTT, as well as the urine analysis, all came back within normal limits. Her ABG showed a normal pH and was only significant for a slightly low PO2. However, her lactic acid was slightly increased at 2.8, and a rapid flu test came back positive for influenza A. She was bolus 1 liter normal saline while I was waiting on the laboratory testing to come back, and she was started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. Her oxygen saturation improved to 96% on 2 liters nasal cannula, and her temperature and heart rate were dropping as well after fluids and antipyretics. Her capillary refill had improved to 4 seconds on re-examination, and she was no longer cyanotic. She was also given a duoneb breathing treatment as well during her stay, and she had improved significantly at this point. However, looking at her chart, she does have underlying diabetes, COPD, and lives in a nursing home all of which place her at a higher risk for complications of influenza. In addition, I tried taking her off oxygen and she desat it to 87% on room air, and thus she had to be admitted for influenza A and hypoxia, treated with Tamiflu, 75 milligrams. So most of the time the flu is gonna be a self-limited infection, as in our first example. However, as you saw in this scenario, it is associated with increased morbidity and mortality in higher risk populations. So simply put, in the adult patient with no high risk conditions, that put them at risk of complications of a secondary bacterial pneumonia or other complications who has been diagnosed with the flu and they're less than 65 years of age, if they present to you within 48 hours of illness onset, you can prescribe antiviral therapy such as Tamiflu, 75 milligrams twice a day for five days to reduce the duration of illness. However, keep in mind that Tamiflu is expensive, especially for those that don't have insurance and has only been proven to reduce the duration of flu symptoms by about one day. However, if you have the same scenario and the patient presented after 48 hours from illness onset, antiviral treatment should not be done because they're unlikely to benefit. But what if you have a patient with the flu who presented 48 hours after illness onset and they only have mild symptoms, but they have one or more of the risk factors out of our mnemonic season of influenza, and they tell you that they're not improving, then they as well should be treated with Tamiflu 75 milligrams twice a day for five days. In addition, it is important to treat all of your patients with symptomatic supportive therapy. I typically tell my patients in which have no known contraindications to Motrin, Tylenol, 
or liquid Benadryl that they can take these medications over the counter. Tylenol 1 gram every 8 hours and Motrin 800 milligrams for headache, sore throat, and myalgias can sometimes be all that the patient really needs. In addition, I truly believe in liquid Benadryl for throat pain. I have personally used it for my viral pharyngitis that I acquire from working around sick patients and I educate my patients to gargle liquid Benadryl in the back of their throat for 10 to 15 seconds and spit it out. It has some analgesic effects and works to coat the throat. Also, make sure to tell your adult patients about drinking warm tea of their choosing with some honey in it for the cough and I typically also prescribe Tessalon pearls 100 milligrams three times a day for about a couple days. Furthermore, be sure to tell your patients to practice good hand hygiene and wash their hands frequently and cover their mouth when they cough. You are also going to want to write them out of school or work for about five days and tell them to remain at home until their signs and symptoms of influenza have stopped. The average duration of shedding the virus is going to vary between healthy individuals, with some studies finding individuals still infectious up until about 4.8 days, 6 days, 7 days, and even still infectious up to 10 days in some healthy individuals. In addition, those patients who are immunocompromised can shed the virus up to 19 days infecting others so you can start to appreciate why antiviral therapy would be indicated not only to shorten the duration of symptoms, but it also shortens the duration of shedding of the virus so those immunocompromised patients aren't going to go around getting everybody else sick. Well, that's everything we're going to talk about today. If you have any questions, as always, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.